So thank you very much. My name is Pam Cressy. I'm the president of the Alexander Historical Society. Uh, these awards have been given, actually, the, the uh, high school awards started in 1984. So we're actually, you are the 40th year recipients of these awards. The society is re uh, recognizing its 50th year of operation. So just 10 years in to its existence, it started the high school awards recognizing that students were the future of history in many ways and the future of our contemporary communities. And so we want to honor all the high school um, honorees tonight and the previous high school people. You're noted on our website and uh, again will be uh, recognized on our YouTube site. Um, the T. Michael Miller Awards uh, started, um, uh, this is the 31st year and the special awards the 29th year. So we're very, um, we feel that this is an important thing to do with the society's funds and to honor you uh, in silver, uh, which we think, even though it looks very ancient, it will stand up. And I don't think it needs to be polished, which is extremely important. And, uh, and also cups uh, that have a historic theme to them as well. So I'd like to introduce to you um, Debbie Ackerman, who is the chair of our uh, high school awards, who will present those awards. Good evening, everyone. I don't think you're gonna have a problem hearing me. When I was little, my grandmother called me Gravel Gertie. Because I was, whoever that was, a star from the 20s or something. Anyway, good evening. We're so happy to have you here with us this evening. And I welcome you to the Alexander Historical Society Awards. Um, I'm Debbie Ackerman, as you heard. And we're going to be stand, I'll be the person that's giving out the Outstanding Student American History Awards for 2024. We welcome you all to this special event where we celebrate our student and adult award winners. Since 1984, we have recognized a junior or senior from each of the four high schools in the city of Alexandria who have demonstrated excellence in the study of American history. The students will each receive an engraved Jefferson Cup, a monetary award, a year membership to the Alexandria Historical Society, which includes our lectures, and an invitation to publish in the Chronicle, which is our biannual publication. I have had the honor of chairing the student awards portion since 2012. And every year I'm continually amazed by these extraordinary young people who excel academically, but are also gifted in sports, music, theater, and in a variety of other areas. Tonight we recognize their talents and achievements and we ex express gratitude to their parents, family members, teachers, coaches, mentors, and a number of others in their world who have supported these young people with love and devotion. These awards are shared with you. Our first candidate this evening is William, known as Will Lacey, a junior at Alexander City High School who has been nominated by his teacher, Tracy Ford. Um, she is also here with Amanda Kropp, who is a teacher at Alexandria City High School as well. She is our liaison with the Historic Society. And they're gonna be coming up on stage. <laughs> okay, there you go. We want to face forward so they can see your handsome face. William Will Lacey is a junior at Alexandria City High School. He's been nominated by his teacher, Tracy Ford. She describes Will as expressing such enthusiasm about United States history that he has contributed to a positive impact on his classmates. He has extensive personal knowledge of American history, particularly American presidents and supplements class discussions and activities with significant information, which deepens engagement with the material. Will is in Ms. Ford's Honors United States and Virginia History class, 
earning an overall 3.6 grade point average. Additionally, Will is an active member of the school's theater department, participating in last year's fall play, Everything Happens at Night. He is currently part of the ensemble cast of Bring It On, the spring musical. Will is enthusiastic about acting, theater, and movies, and after graduation, his objective is to commit more time to acting in the theater. Will's other interests include spending time with his grandparents, his friends, and his dog scout. Ms. Ford added that Will's passion makes him the perfect candidate for this award. Congratulations. Candidate is Kate Nixon, a junior at St. Stephen's and St. Agnes School, who has been nominated by her teacher, David Hillink. David is here tonight with Kate Hardwick, who is also a teacher at St. Stephen's and St. Agnes, and she is also our li liaison with the Alexander Historical Society. Kate, you don't want to join us? Oh, for crying out loud. See, I thought I was going to embarrass her. Man, she's tough. You're stubborn. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Um, David Hillenick, um is an upper school history teacher, and he nominated Kate due to her deep curiosity about the past and its impact on the present. Mr. Hillink describes that Kate explores historical material with enthusiasm, reaching thoughtful conclusions from documentary and other forms of evidence. An energetic participant in class discussion, Kate evokes admiration from teachers and peers for the wisdom and insight of her contributions. She is currently writing an independent research paper about the Red Scare that engulfed the nation following World War II. Mr. Hillink notes that she has the historical skills to address what occurred, occurred during this time period and to draw important lessons for the 21st century from her research. Kate has a number of interests outside academics. She's an active member of the theater program, having participated in a variety of productions, most recently is a lead costume designer for this year's play, The Sound of Music, where she used her historical skills <coughs> researching the styles and materials reflecting mid 20th century Central Europe. Kate also participates in community service activities, such as senior outreach and reading with refugee children. She has her earned Heads List Honors and school recognition for her work in history and English, twice winning gold medals in the national French competition. Last summer, Kate attended the Governor's School for the Humanities, where she studied playwriting, philosophy, and Zen Buddhism. Congratulations. Our next outstanding student is Duke Shackelford, a junior at Episcopal High School was nominated by Michael Reynolds, his history teacher. Mr. Reynolds describes Duke as a standout student in his United States history course, earning high list academic honors for the fall semester. Described as a leader in the classroom during discussions, Duke has consistently earned A's on challenging assignments. He is a gifted analytical writer who has a command of the areas of history pursued this year. Duke's major research paper addressed how television news coverage impacted the course of the Vietnam War. He researched both primary and secondary sources, establishing, establishing a solid argument detailing how negative war coverage impacted protest movements and American policymakers. 
In addition to academics, Duke has been involved in many aspects of the Episcopal high school community. He's an active participant in athletic activities, playing on the football and lacrosse teams. Recently, his interest in sports has switched to behind the scenes as he has taken a lead in Episcopal's new sports media program, broadcasting games and providing commentary to support the school's teams and fans. Congratulations. Our next student award winner is Charlotte Rader, who is a senior at Bishop Ireton High School. She is here this evening with Marie Ar Marcuson, who is Bishop Ireton's department chair. She is also uh, Charlotte's teacher, and she is the liaison to our program. And Marie is joined with, by Erin O'Leary, who is director of counseling. So if they would all come up, please. She can come up. I want to note that I've known Marie for 14 years. She's been my uh, stable, ongoing teacher liaison for that number of times, and I hope for many more years. Ms. Marcuson describes Charlotte as one of the most strongly motivated, sophisticated, intelligent, and analytical thinkers in the faculty's experience, which she demonstrated in advanced placement, United States government, and politics, and advanced placement comparative politics courses. Her abilities are superlative, demonstrated by a quick and agile mind in conjunction with a sterling work ethic, intellectual curiosity, and a love of learning through reading. In class discussions, Charlotte is never content with surface knowledge, but she seeks to understand the underlying causes, effects, and meanings of historical and political events. Ms. Marcuson points out that Charlotte is eloquent and articulate, contemplating other points of view before firmly, but politely standing her ground in debate without being aggressive or dismissive. Charlotte excels with a grade point average over 4.5%, ranks in the top 1% of her class, is a member of the National Honor Society, and president of the Roe Kappa Honor Society for Social Studies. At graduation, Charlotte will have completed 10 advanced placement classes and numerous honors classes. During her high school career, she has been a number, member of la lacrosse, softball, and track teams, and is currently senior leader and stage crew as a member of Bishop Ireton's drama program. She is considered by her peers as a leader and role model on and off the field. Her favorite service activities include serving meals to the homeless at Christ House, picking produce at Arcadia Farm at Mar Vernon for the needy, and volunteering at work camp. Ms. Marcuson describes Charlotte as friendly, gentle, and a thoroughly kind-hearted person, as well as exceptionally gifted and well-rounded, who will contribute markedly whether she attends William & Mary or the University of Virginia in the fall. Congratulations. Let's give another round of applause to our student award winners. You know, you hear about their achievements and what they're doing at such young ages, and you just know the future is in good hands. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Scott Vierick. I'm the chair of the Alexandria Historical Society History Awards that we give to adults. 
Uh, I don't have a fun nickname like Debbie did when she was growing up. Uh, I just got a lot of Scott, shh. So hopefully you'll be able to hear me okay. But it's my pleasure tonight to announce the winners of the Special Merit Award and the Team Michael Miller Award. Now the Alexandria Historical Society, when we approach these awards, we purposefully cast a wide net. Anyone involved in the research, interpretation, communication, and preservation of our city's history is eligible to be recognized. This year, it worked out kind of interestingly. All of our winners have a connection to primary source archival research, which is the bedrock of our understanding of the past. So I want to talk a little bit about that, why it's important, and why the, the work that our winners do is so worthy of recognition. So we're spoiled when it comes to chances to interact with history here in Alexandria. Sites like the Lee Fendel House, the Freedom House Museum, Carlisle House, the Alexandria Black History Museum, Gadsby's Tavern, Friendship Firehouse, the Archaeology Museum, the Apothecary, Fort Ward, and of course, the Alexandria History Mu Museum here at the Lyceum. Through their exhibits, tours, and programs, connect us with Alexandria's past, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Beyond these sites, a network of waysides and historic markers, continually updated, allow us to understand key places like Friedman Cemetery, Canal Place, Potomac Yard, and the Sunnyside Subdivision, just to name a few. Now beyond that, in the digital realm, the Office of Historic Alexandria, and of course, us here at the Alexandria Historical Society, have a variety of articles and reports on our websites that you can learn to, uh, excuse me, that you can use to learn more about uh, our city's history, and many of the sites I listed have a big social media presence where you can receive well-researched history on your feeds. That's to say nothing of the incredible museums and historic sites just across the river in DC. But here's the thing that's often overlooked. None of this is possible, not the waysides, not the tours, not the lectures, not even the social media posts without historic research using primary sources and archival sources. The process of going through archives, reading primary source documents, and synthesizing them into information that can then be used by others is critical. Make no mistake, this can be a challenging process. Some collections, they're not well organized, meaning that historians have to shift through countless documents with no guarantee they'll find what they need. Faded print, crappy handwriting, and add even more challenges. Now, even once this information is collected, even once the historian is home from the archive, the work's not done. The historian then has to synthesize this information and consider what sources are more trustworthy, which sources have more information. They also need to consider what voices are missing from the archives, what information has been left out of the record, and then make a decision about how they're gonna move forward with all the information they have and all the information they don't have. Now beyond that, historical research, it doesn't just mean looking at old documents. Many historians today are also conducting oral histories, doing site visits, analyzing photographs and video uh, recordings, and incorporating archeological reports into their work. Now this is time consuming, difficult, and often expensive work. Even with the many digitized collections available today, historical research is not something that you can simply Google your way out of. It takes time, it takes a skilled researcher, but it's through this process that we can increase our historical knowledge. So the Alexandria Historical Society, as you all know, was founded 50 years ago. And it's been very remarkable to look back on the publications from that era and compare them to the information we have today. By and large, our understanding of the past, it has grown, it's evolved, and today we've got a far more expansive, relevant, and ultimately richer understanding of the past. And the reason for this is that over the past 50 years, historians, whether working at a college, whether working for the city, or whether working on their own times, have done that research. They've gone into the archives, they've synthesized that information, and they've helped make that available to the wider public. So that's why it's critical that we not only have historians who conduct this work, but also that we as a society are willing to fund that work so that historians have the resources they need to answer these questions and dig into the records and come up with this information. So we're honoring three individuals tonight. The first award we're giving out is the T. Michael Miller Award. Now this was named after former Alexandria historian and former president of the Alexandria Historical Society, T. Michael Miller. 
and it recognizes an individual or organization who has given decades of service to history, inter interpretation, or preservation, or all of the above in this city. So our first winner, he has literally helped write the history of historic preservation. He's a former historic preservation consultant, National Park Service historian, and he's currently a lecturer at the University of Maryland School of Architecture. He's written three books, Heritage Conservation in the United States, Crafting the Preservation Criteria, and Saving Spaces. See, we've got visual aids tonight. <laughs> All of these books he's written are valuable sources for citizens, public officials, civil servants, and students. They talk about how the historical preservation movement has evolved, its successes, and its failures. Now, he is also a person who practices what he preaches right here in Alexandria. He has served on the Alexandria Historical Restoration and Preservation Commission, the Board of Architectural Review, and the Historic Alexandria Foundation. In 2022, he served as the treasurer on the Alexandria Historical Society, helping the society find its financial footing as it emerged from COVID. So not only was he taking on this new role, he was also tasked with figuring out how much money did we have, and where was it? <laughs> so he took on that role, and as a result, the organization is on a much firmer financial footing than it was when he took over. So on behalf of the awards committee, I am pleased to award the 2024 T. Michael o. Miller Award to John Sprinkle. <laughs> now you're probably wondering, where is John Sprinkle? <laughs> So John couldn't make it tonight, so accepting this award on his behalf is the head of Alexandria Archaeology, Dr. Eleanor Breen. Thank you so much, Scott and Pam, and um, members of the Historical Society. John Sprinkle sent a few words that he was hoping um, I could contribute tonight, so I'll read this as if I'm John. Um, he said, thank you to the Alexandria Historical Society for presenting me with the T. Michael Miller Award. It is especially heartwarming to be recognized by one's colleagues and neighbors. I'm sorry I cannot be in attendance, but Esther and I are at our son's penultimate college lacrosse match in New York City. So he is sorry he cannot be here. Uh, but he sa sends his congratulations to Amy and to Abby and to all of the students who have uh, won an award tonight. Um, John said, Alexandria is blessed to have generations of history-minded citizens who continue to be dedicated to the conservation of places associated with our town's unique history. Alexandria has been and will continue to be a frequent case study in his exploration of the evolution of American historic preservation. So for those students that are going into um, degrees in history, you may one day find yourself assigned to read one of uh, John's books in, in your classes, and it is uh, definitely worth actually reading all the pages <laughs> and, and uh, taking on the lessons that um, John has developed over the years. So happy to accept this on his behalf. Now, Dr. Breen, you're on your honor to actually give it to John and not tape over his name with your name on there. <laughs> we won't eat anything off of it. <laughs> so last year, we gave two winners the T. Michael Miller Award. And this year, as you can see from the screen behind me, we're doing the same thing. So we're recognizing another uh, worthy Alexandrian. This individual is a lifelong researcher, writer, communicator, and teacher of preservation and local history. She's been an Alexandria civil servant since 1996, and through her work at various departments over the years, has conducted research on many different topics relating to the city's past. Most recently, her article, Slaves at the Lusa, Views of an African American Family, was included in the book, Alexandria at War, 1861 to 1865, African American Emancipation in an Occupied City which was edited by Alexandria Historical Society Vice President Audrey Davis, and which some of the funding came from the Historical Society for this book. The article tells the story of an enslaved family who were forced to work at the Volusa Plantation, which was located towards the west end of the city just off of present-day Duke Street. 
This individual is a former Alexandria Historical Society board member, and she also used to edit our newsletter. So she wore many different hats, not only with the city, but also with the Historical Society. In addition to her work with the city of Alexandria, she also teaches classes at Northern Virginia Community College. For that reason, on behalf of the awards committee, I am pleased to award Amy Birch the 2024 Team Michael Miller Award. for me. <laughs> I just like to thank the Historical Society in particular, Pam Cressy and Audrey Davis um, for their work here, for their work at Historic Alexandria. They were the ones who always asked compelling questions and it gave me a chance to try to find some of those answers and having their support uh, throughout my career has been uh, really important and to receive this recognition now means a great deal. So thank you all. You know, I never realized it, but if you like take that plate out into the sun, like you can really direct light. <laughs> like, like you need to start a fire, just take that plate out and you know, your campfire set. Use responsibly. So we've got one more award tonight. It is the Special Merit Award. And this is, this is meant to recognize an individual or organization for a specific project that advances research, interpretation, or preservation relating to the city's past. Now this year's winner is an independent historian who, has, who was contracted by the city of Alexandria to research a key location from the city's history, our iconic waterfront. Through dedicated research, she pieced together the story of how the waterfront was defined and built out, unearthing the stories of the enslaved people, indentured servants, and hired workers who constructed the wharves. Not only that, but she also, in addition to writing a very extensive and comprehensive report, also created a digital story map, which provides an accessible introduction to the research that she did, and you can find that on the city's website. Efforts like that help make her work accessible to the wider public. Now, not only has her research helped put a more human face on this part of the city's history, but it has also helped the city prepare for the future. Her research is being used by the city to help plan its flood mitigation efforts as Alexandria seeks to adapt to the reality of climate change. So on behalf of the awards committee, I am pleased to award Dr. Abby Schreiber the 2024 Special Merit Award. So much everyone this is very gratifying to get recognized for my work that I've been doing for the last few years I want to thank my colleagues at Alexandria archaeology especially Eleanor um, Garrett and Ben Ben has helped me immensely with all the images if you have read my 700 page report which I'm sure <laughs> all of you have you'll see many awesome images which Ben helped a lot with so I really appreciate all of their help and support as well as my other colleagues in archaeology and in historic Alexandria. Um, and, you know, this is just a really nice way to end my tenure in this position. So thank you very much. So let's give another round of applause to all of our winners. Now, I also want to take this moment to thank the other members of the awards committee. So Tricia Walker and Catherine Weinrub could not be here tonight, but one other committee member, Dr. Brenda Mitchell-Powell, she is here tonight. And I could not have done the work that I did with this committee without the help of these three amazing individuals who not only give their time to the Historical Society, but give their time to many other projects and jobs throughout the year. So I'm very grateful for their time. I'm grateful for their expertise. 
They might made my job a heck of a lot easier, and I can't imagine doing what I do without them. So again, let's all give a round of applause. Uh, Brenda, if you want to stand up, and <laughs> Catherine and uh, Trisha are here in spirit. So we're now going to move on to the next phase of our evening. In years past, we typically would have a keynote speaker who would speak on a specific topic, but this year, since it's our 50th anniversary, we decided we're going to mix it up a little and have a panel discussion about a topic that's relevant to our student winners and also the rest of our attendees. Now, as a historical society, we're obviously big fans of getting a history degree. Um, and to those of our student winners who are graduating this year, I can just say that as a graduate of the College of William and Mary, they have a wonderful history degree uh, program that I definitely recommend. So not trying to influence anything, but you know, just keep it in mind. Uh, still, there is the old stereotype that unless you want to be a teacher, you can't do much with the history degree. And in fact, someone once told me that to my face while I was working at a historic site. So it's a pretty pervasive stereotype but obviously it's not true. And in fact, to provide a counter narrative tonight, we've convened this panel to talk about the value of getting a history degree. Now, our panelists, they all work in different jobs and they've all had different career paths. But what unites them is that they all have a history degree or are currently working towards one. So we hope this discussion will help show that there are many career paths that one can do after studying history and hopefully assuage any anxieties for anyone who is planning on majoring in history, or anyone whose children are planning on majoring in history. So if I could have our panelists join me on stage right now, where we've got three great panelists this evening. as interns at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park, and I continue to learn from Alex even to this day, including recently when I learned that World War I reenacting was a thing. <laughs> now, our second panelist right there in the middle, Michael Johnson is a lifelong Alexandrian who works for the city in community outreach. But beyond that, he also works as a community historian, and he's enhanced the city's understanding of its history. He's researched the history of the Parker Gray High School. He's presented his research at numerous talks and conferences. Michael has also tirelessly worked to renovate and share the history of Douglas Memorial Cemetery. Thanks to his efforts, after years of effort, there is now an ongoing restoration project to return the cemetery to good condition. Now, he's also working to establish an oral history project to better understand, under, understand the history of this burial ground, and he produces a quarterly newsletter about the cemetery. Now, Michael is a stakeholder of the cemetery. Several of his family members are buried there. And he is currently majoring in history at, and Michael, correct me if I pronounce this wrong, Coppin State University? Coppin State, yeah. Coppin State University, where he is a member of the Alpha Theta Honor Society. <coughs> Michael is a member of the Alexandria African American Hall of Fame. He's founded the Social Responsibility Group and the Friends of Douglas Cemetery. Closest to me to further out. So Finley. 
So I was raised by my grandparents, so I was surrounded by old movies, old music, history, stories in general. Um, but I started noticing some discrepancies in the stories they would tell. So it sparked a little bit of an investigative uh, stirring within me, and I wanted to get the full narrative. So uh, I started looking further into archives and stuff like that and learning that there's a whole new world out there for me to dive into. Michael, go ahead. Uh, for me, being a graduate of T.C. Williams High School, it was a teacher in the name, Mr. George Weber. He first inspired me to really open up my mind to, you know, to learn history. And then, uh, fast forward, I went, uh, when I was about 21, I don't know where she at, I visited the uh, torpedo factory and ran into Miss Pam Kersey. At the time, she was doing... Uh, research on my uncle, who was 100, wait, at that time he was 98 years old, he used to still ride a bike. He died at about 104. Uh, and then from meeting her, it inspired me to really get back into uh, what I loved the best, because I had kids early, so I had to work. Uh, then there was a guy named Mr. Robert Dawkins who just passed, his brother is Judge Nolan Dawkins. He told me to go back, uh, him and uh, Dr. Elizabeth Clark Lewis Howard University, he said, you need to finish that degree you started back in the early, well, mid-70s. So that's how I got here. And uh, it's been a whirlwind for me, just opening my mind up, learning the history, and then working with uh, Eleanor and the uh, city archaeologist and uh, Scott and him. It's just been amazing, really. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, I always like to joke that I was bad at math and science, so I had to be good at something. Me too. Um, so I fell into the history field. I grew up uh, in Tennessee, so surrounded by a bunch of Civil War battlefields. My dad and I would go all the time. Um, and so I would just kind of, I would like to walk around. I would, I would ask too many questions to the, to the rangers there, driving them nuts. Um, and so I started getting more into history. Um, and then I went to school. Uh, I went to college, initially wanted to go into history, then went into political science and realized I hated political science. So I went back into history, um, and that's kind of how I started my career. But I really got my love of history uh, kind of early on through high school, and then it, it uh, blossomed more in college. And uh, this time we'll go towards me. So Alex, when you decided to major in history, what, va what skills, values, what were you hoping to get out of it? Um, yeah, so I think I was hoping to just kind of do what I, I liked, right? Just kind of keep reading and keep learning about things, finding new topics. Um, I didn't really actually expect to enjoy writing and reading. Like in high school, I hated writing. I hated reading. I went into the wrong field, and then I learned to love it in, in college. Um, but I really, uh, I just kind of went in wanting to uh, just study history, and the skills that I got of research, writing, and analysis that I use, use now, those grew. So I, went, I kind of followed my passion, and then the skills came with it. Wonderful. Michael? Uh, yeah, for me, it was that uh, I never got a chance to meet any of my grandparents. And I thought that was a big loss as I grew up. And then by me uh, going back to school at Coppin State, where I'm the president of Phi Alpha Theta, so I want the seniors to applaud because I'd be giving them young folks hell. But uh, the thing was, I didn't know any of my history uh, of my family. And when I started learning about it, I found out that my family dated back here in Virginia to 1790. Uh, my great-great-grandmother walked from Kentucky to Virginia by way of the cattle slavery. And there she gave birth to my uh, great-great-grandfather. Uh, so for me, it's been a personal journey because I wanted to learn all I could about history, but then again, I wanted to make sure that I learned about everyone else's history as well and how we tied in together because I know that a lot of the African-American history is unwritten. Uh, so I want to make sure that I research it and that I can do an honest uh, observation and writing when I do write about African-American history, period, here in the city. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I like to think of history as a blanket that gets better with a higher thread count, and as we weave more narratives into it, it just gets better and better. So I was looking for being able to connect the dots between stories that had discrepancies. I was looking at ways to add new narratives 
in and I was looking for a way to make more people interested in history to show that everything out there does have a past and we can show it we can tell people mm -hmm. about it um, and we can love it and cherish it perfect so thinking about both your jobs and your volunteer work you know what are the skills that you honed in your history degree that you continue to use on a day-to-day -day basis um, you know so we'll start with Finley and uh, Finley Beyond, you know, trying to keep us crazy senior historians at HAI happy. <laughs> what else are you using those skills? I'm my roommate's news source. <laughs> Every morning he's like, what's happened today? And I'm like, well, I have read three different newspapers, so let me summarize this for you. So being able to take a bunch of different sources and summarize it and condense it into a bite-sized little narrative for people is a very valuable source because no one's going to read 30 different books. You have to be able to tell them directly what's happening. And Finley, could you talk a little bit, you know, at HAI, um, and I probably should have said this earlier. I also work at HAI. Um, at HAI, uh, you know, we can't talk about every single project we do, but can you talk about one of the projects you've done and what skills you've used to keep the project moving forward and keep the client happy? Absolutely. Um, we actually worked with uh, John Carroll University, and we are processing their collection for Tim Russert of um, Meet the Press. So as we're going through their collections, we are digitizing it and turning it into a online exhibit. So that'll make it more accessible, these materials that they have to the public and also curate a uh, cool and interesting exhibit for them. Uh, there's a bunch of different materials in it, so we have to catalog them, we have to house them very carefully, we have to digitize the photos in very specific ways. But yeah, so there's an archival aspect to it as well as a sort of digitization and curation aspect and also historian aspect as well because we are writing tidbits about each item that we put into this exhibit. It's very interesting stuff. Yeah, so turn to Michael. Either volunteer work, you know, the stuff you're doing on your own time or your City of Alexandria work. Uh, I do a combination of both. Uh, basically, if you heard about the community cookouts that we do in the different neighborhoods, I'm the one that organized and started that. Uh, to bring our resources to every community, not just one sector of the city. Unlike my predecessors here, I read a lot of books. I'm doing a uh, research paper right now to finish up on Wounded Knee. And most of my time is spent doing work on my lunch break and after work, reading four of the books that I have to read in order to compile that story on Wounded Knee and what happened there. Uh, my other work is that I work with kids in crisis here in the city, which I really love, you know, uh, some of the at-risk kids. Um, I was attached to a special unit with the police department called a community engagement unit, which I got a lot, a lot of uh, inside information on how law enforcement work, and also I brought to law enforcement how they should work more in unity with the community. Wonderful. And Alex, so, you know, not many people think history degree, cybersecurity. So yeah. how do you use the skill of that major in your daily job, or, you know, figuring out what terrifying things on the Internet are coming to kill us? <laughs> Honestly, yeah, that is that is terrifying. Um, I always like to, to introduce myself to people, uh, especially my field, that I'm a former museum curator turned cyber threat intel analyst. And they always get a weird look in their face about, like, how did you do that, right? Um, everyone views the word cyber and everyone freaks out, right? Because... Cyber is apparently scary. I mean, it is. Uh, you know, two-factor authentication. Please be safe online, right? But um, uh, the idea that that history provided me was I know how to research, write, and think, right? And that's really what my job a lot of the time is. You can give me any topic. You can give me any, any subject, any threat actor that I'm tracking. I'm, I'm researching, I'm writing, and I'm thinking about how they might affect us in the future, right? And... All I'm doing is I'm taking the skills that I had in history and then just changing the, the uh, base language of it, right? So I'm not writing about, you know, what happened in the 1700s. I'm writing about a type of malware or a type of ransomware or a type of threat actor using cyber effects. Um, what I found in my field and what I found talking to some of my colleagues is the cyber stuff is actually really easy to learn. It's the research, writing, and thinking that is the hardest part to learn, right? Um, and so 
that is honestly how I made that jump. I, I pitched myself to people as someone who knows how to research right. They don't even have to teach me how to do that. Um, all they had to teach me was the cyber. Um, they laughed in my face when I said that all they had to teach me was cyber. Um, it's a little bit harder than I thought it would be, but it's still really easy uh, once you start getting the hang of it. Um, but really, uh, just being able to like think critically, and, and uh, one, of the, one of the things that I use a lot is um, when we look at intelligence, right, everyone always wants to think about how it affects our future, um, but we fail to forget that things that happened in the past affect, what, affect the way someone is doing something now, right? A policy that they had 40 years ago is affecting why they're doing X, Y, Z. So if you understand the history about where they came from to where they are now, you get a great understanding of where they might go in the future. Sam? And would you say that's, in general, that idea of being able to research right and quickly understand, is that something that's applicable to many careers, not just cybersecurity? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd argue that most people don't know how to read, or, don't know how to write and research. Right? Um, most people, the only writing they've done is either for work or you know in that you know freshman like writing seminar you had to do in college. Um, but when you get out, when you're out in the real world, right, and you're working with people who haven't done a lot of research or they haven't done a lot of writing, you you kind of you see that, um, and so. As long as you can come in and, and become an expert on a topic and be able to write on it and present it, you know, that's, that's great. Um, I would also argue that in history, you have to be able to defend yourself. You have to def be able to defend your arguments, right? And so in, in outside of just the history field, you have to defend what you're saying. You have to get up and brief and, and tell people why what you're saying matters, right? So being able to defend your thesis in history uh, really does translate um, into... The, the real world as well. And I want to I wanna really zero in on that whole idea of being able to bring yourself up to speed on something and become conversant in it really quickly. You know, that's a skill that a history degree is really important for. And that's something that Finley and I do every day with history associates where so much of our jobs involve being put on projects that we may or may not know anything about. Like, I, I've done projects for postal meters, children's hospitals, uh, once even a bat poop. Long story. Uh, so Finley, would you, again, knowing that we can't talk about all of our projects, can you give some examples of some of the projects you've worked on where you had to get up to speed really quickly on something and the history yeah. skills helped out on that? Oh boy. Um, we worked with a government agency on their records and I was unfamiliar with their records group and um, the record group classification system. However, because I was familiar with archival studies and their practices, I was able to sort of know that this shape went into this hole. And as I went along with it, I was like, oh, I'm noticing patterns here that, oh, this number and identifier goes with this group of records. So being able to make these jumps because you're seeing patterns in the records is very valuable. All right, so this next question is to the group in general. So whoever wants to talk first. Uh, when you look back on the classes, or if you're currently taking classes, what's been the most valuable class? Not your favorite class, but the one that you still take those lessons with you, the one you still refer back to, the one you remember of like, yep, I'm a better historian, I'm a better person as a result of taking this class. Well, I'll jump. Uh, for me, it was, it was my anthropology class, and the way they research and the way they study, we all really tied in together, even though they have these diff different names. And one of the biggest projects that I worked on um, while at Coppin State was on the Laurel Cemetery in Baltimore where they had uh, 36,000 burials there. And people said that they had moved the bodies, but yet when they did the uh, radio, I mean the uh, underground uh, sonar, ground penetration radar, they said that they counted 28,000 bodies. So they think they moved some of them, but not all of them. And I did that in conjunction with John Hopkins University, who has some real, very bright young folks in there. And just to end this, I would say the next one is I'm doing right now uh, with the uh, Baltimore Black Sox Memorial. So I've been researching them, and I found out that four of their top players came right out of Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, one of them was Mr. Leon Day. Uh, Howard Turner, his brother Cleveland Turner, and a guy named Mr. Michael Casey. And me sitting in that room finding that out, it was like, wow, 
I'm from Alexandria, you know, so I, I can claim this. And Indians, I would say, as historians, I don't know how, we, we all gonna look at history a different way, but to me is when I open the door, there's another door, another door, another door, another door. So I'm keep going through those doors, and it's been very inspiring to, to just open those different doors and work with the different people that I've came in contact with. I'd argue that for, for me, uh, the best classes that I took were uh, my senior seminars and my, my graduate thesis, right? The ones where I got to do a lot of research um, and writing. However, like in my current field, any of the like Cold War history courses, when I was in, in school, I didn't know I was gonna end up in the field I was in. So I was like, I don't really wanna study the Cold War. Give me like early American history and I'm happy with that. Probably should have paid attention a little bit more. Um, <laughs> But those were, those were great for, for my, my base knowledge, um, just to kind of get a picture of, of where the world is at now. But honestly, any class where I could do my own research, do my own writing, um, was probably one of the most beneficial. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, the class that influenced me most was Women in Crime in American History. Um, and it influenced me because the intersectionality of it really expanded how I looked at history. It was like, hey, we're gonna look at the racial aspect, we're gonna look at the wealth aspect, we're gonna look at the gender aspect of history and how these things influence the crimes that these women committed and how some were acquitted because, oh, it's a feminine crime, like, oh, this lady poisoned her husband. And so it was really interesting to look at the newspaper clippings from like different trials in different eras and see the reactions of the public at the time. So I wanna pose a hypothetical. You've been tasked with hiring someone for your organization. And somebody comes to you, they're a current history major, and they're interested in an informational interview. And they say, hey, I love your, what your organization is doing. I love the work you're doing. You know, what can I really focus on now that I'm in school that's going to help me get a job when I graduate? Uh, yeah, I'll go. Um, so for me, I would, I would argue, um, really focus on uh, global topics, right? Really focus on, um, you know, what's happening in the world around you. If you take a modern history course, I would say do that. Um, the one thing I always stress, uh, no matter what field you wanna get into, is whenever you have the opportunity to get an internship, take it, um, because those internships are gonna open doors. It's gonna show up on your resume as you having practical work experience. Um, because when you try and enter, uh, so just some background, right? I don't have a military background. Everyone I work with, most of them have military backgrounds. They came from the military. Uh, trying to get into the intelligence field without being prior military is incredibly challenging. Um, so one thing I had wish I had done was done internships in this field. Um, but doing internships, taking modern courses, um, just kind of uh, talking to people, right? One of the ways I got uh, my current job is I just started talking to people. I started making connections. I hate the word networking, but it is it is something you got to do. Um, so that's what I would that's what I would say. Um, and also like put yourself out there with resumes. Um, just apply to anything. If you're interested in, in a position, if you're interested in an internship, you know find as many as you can and just apply to them because one of them is going to come through. Um, so that's what I would say. Uh, for me. Uh I would ditto some of the things you said, but any internship that you can get that's free, get on it, because you get valuable experience that way. Some internships, are you, you get paid for them. Those are the ones you have to apply yourself a little bit more to because you don't want to fail. And the other thing I would tell somebody that's getting into history is that um, make sure that your study habits and you can do away with a lot of your, your social media and your partying and all of that because my weekends are tied up either researching or writing a paper. But it's very rewarding at the end. And whatever experience you can get in this field, I would say take it, you know, and uh, help rewrite some of the things that was written wrong about our history. I would say learn to write for specific audiences, learn to cater your writing. It's a very powerful tool to have in your belt. Um, I would also say make friends with Excel. It'll come in handy. <laughs> you will use it way more than you think. 
And also, a lot of things in the historical world and the archive world need updating. So if you have something like Python, SQL, or any other programming language, that will look excellent, even if it's amateur. That'll be more than base level. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Alex, you know, made the joke earlier that he majored in history because he hated math. And, you know, that's true for a lot of people in the history field. That's definitely yeah. true of me. So you can definitely make yourself more competitive by leaning into the numbers aspect of history. And especially with digital history becoming more important, having that programming understanding, having that programming knowledge can help make yourself more competitive. Uh, I am curious of the group, uh, did any of you double major in college? I was one credit shy of political science, but I was like, so I was one credit shy of political science, but it was a level 400 class, so my options were stay an extra semester or graduate, and I chose graduate, thank you. <laughs> well, something that we have in common is when I first went to school, and I'm not going to really date myself, date, uh, when I first went to college, I was also a political science major, you know, and um, it was very rewarding. And then when I stopped to go back, I said, no, I'm just going to do straight history out here, you know, but yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I realized that, like I said earlier, I didn't like political science. Uh, so I just minored in that because I had a couple more classes I needed to take to get my minor and then I was done with it. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I had actually double majored or uh, actually spent more time in like languages. Because um, one thing I didn't do a lot of was languages. Um, and so that's one thing I kind of wish I majored in um, or added that on to my major. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's something to keep in mind for anybody who's heading off to college is not all your classes are going to be in your major. And in fact, a lot of schools have things called general education requirements. So even if you're like, even if you're like Alex and you're like, oh boy, history, no math. Odds are there's probably going to be a math class. Yeah. Um, so think about how you're going to be using, filling up those other class spaces and how you can connect to some of the skills that, that we've been talking about tonight. Yeah. Also, Scott, I would like to tell him, uh, me being 67 years old, would you classify as a senior? Uh, it's a new type of, well, for Coppin State, I was a, a student that they saw that wasn't an ordinary student. But they tried to run me through all these different ringers to see where I was at. And then when I won the uh, Fannie J. Coppin Award, which is the highest award you can win at Coppin State as a history major, all the professors, well, the kids, you think I was a professor anyway, but I wasn't. <laughs> but all the professors and the kids started calling me, asking me my opinion on things. And I think that was been the greatest reward of me being a senior, going back to school, to finish up a degree. And when I finish with it, I'm a volunteer here in the city. Uh, because this is where my heart is, really. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's a valuable point that, you know, it's not necessarily a straight line in terms of education. And, you know, I know plenty of people who they've graduated 20 years ago, but they're going back and taking community college classes relating to history or some other interests. So, you know, lifelong learning is a really valuable tool for anybody, regardless of their major, regardless of their career path. Uh, I've got a couple more questions, but do anybody in the audience have any questions for any of our panelists? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <that's the> <laughs> so Pam's question is, can we stop now? <laughs> All right. Um, so last question for the group. What are you excited about when it comes to the future of history, whether it's your own career paths or the field in general? I'm really excited about handwriting and OCRing. So OCRing is when uh, computers read text and then turn it into like legible stuff. Um, so there are leaps and bounds happening right now where people are using batches of specific people's handwriting so that the programs can learn how to read handwriting because that's always been a very difficult aspect of our field because we're not really teaching cursive nowadays. Mm -hmm. So that is a skill that I personally have been worried about, is how are our future historians going to be able to read like 1600, 1700s handwritten documents and ledgers and stuff like that? Is that going to be lost? But, you know, it's a step forward. We're making progress in that. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. I'm also very excited about that. I learned how to read in cursive, <laughs> but some people in the past, they just had really, really terrible handwriting. They do. <laughs> I didn't used to wear glasses when I was reading from lecterns. Uh, I'm excited about the uh, work I've been doing with the uh, 
city's archaeological department and the old history that we've been capturing because I'm looking at down the road in the future when I'm probably not going to be here. You know, I mean, that's just happening. That's, that's the law of nature. Uh, what our young folks would be able to read and take in about where we are today and then go back and see where we came from, I think that would be a real good tie-in to where they might be at later on in their life. And uh, hopefully the history will um, not repeat itself, but open doors for them to put more into history. So for the future generations coming after them, it'll be just that much more rewarding. Yeah, I'd say I'm, I'm excited for new stories coming into the field, um, new perspectives that are being put into museums. Um, you know, that was happening when I was there, and it's, it's happening more now. Uh, I'd also say I'm really, really looking forward to the fact that um, more and more people are recognizing that history degrees can be used beyond just like teaching and museums and lawyers because you hear that all the time, oh, you're going to be a lawyer or, or you're going to be a teacher. Um, but people are recognizing uh, how history is useful. Um, I think one thing I'm also looking forward to in my current field uh, it, in relation to history is there's so much like cybersecurity that isn't being told via history, right? Not a lot of people are doing the history of cyber. Um, and that is a field that I think would be an amazing field for someone to jump into. Um, well, maybe one of the young people, feel free to jump into that. But I think that'd be an amazing field because um, there's so much that's happened in such a short period of time. Um, and I think that would also kind of help bridge that gap between, uh, you know, humanity and cyber um, and make people feel a little bit more comfortable with the word cyber. So, yeah. Wonderful. Alex, Michael, and Finley, thank you so much you. for sharing your expertise. Well, that concludes our evening. I want to thank everyone for coming out. Oh my gosh, did the microphone start working? I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. It's been a pleasure hosting you all here at the Lyceum. The Alexandria Historical Society, we do programming and events throughout the year. We've got another lecture coming up next month. We've got several walking tours in the future. So definitely come back and see us again. Memberships for the year start at only $20. It gets you free admission to our lectures to get you access to our newsletter, our journal, and you know that your money is going to support the work of preserving and educating about history in Alexandria. So membership dues, funded the awards, brought our panelists here, fund our speakers, help fund the creation of some of the books uh, that have been written about the city's past. So your money goes to a worthy cause. So again, thank you all, safe travels, and we still have food over there, so eat up. Yeah.